Thank you so much again, Augustus. It is good, good, good to be together this morning. Once again, I want to welcome you this morning or this afternoon or this evening or whatever time it is that you happen to be joining us or uh, seeing this service, which is recorded. I'm the Reverend Dr. Beth Johnson, and it is my privilege to serve this congregation, Palomar Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. We begin each service and our public gatherings and important and meetings with the acknowledgement of the land that we occupy. I am on the unceded land of the Lusania Nation and the Kumeyaay Nation, as is Palomar UU Fellowship. We invite you, if you have a candle, uh, to light your acknowledgement candle at home. And for those of you who may not be in the San Diego region, which is either Luceno and Kumeyaay or Kumeyaay uh, land, to go ahead and learn about the land that you are on. I like this in particular today for the acknowledgement of the struggle of the Kumeyaay people who are right now um, have, have their ancestral burial lands threatened um, with uh, excavation and explosion to uh, expand uh, the wall at the San Diego, Mexico border. We light that candle in acknowledgement of our call to solidarity as well. So once again, I wanna welcome you I want to thank all the folks who are particip participating in the service today. Susan Thayer, Kathleen Moscato, Augustus Moscato, Michael Muffson, Emily Barker, Katya Hansen, Ritza Sanders, all the folks who work to bring us our services. Again, this service is uh, called Life is a Riddle and a Mystery. It's a uh, question box service, kind of back by popular demand. I haven't done one of these since 2018, which was actually my first one, and it is delightful. I love being able to hear your questions and answer them. Uh, Susan and Kathleen collected the, uh, the questions, put them into categories, and I'll look forward to answering them in a little bit. So it is good, good, good to be together. We invite the bell each week. Once for those who have gone before, once for those who are with us now, and once for those who will come after. Breathe with me and arrive to this time, to this place, with these people in this unique moment. Never again will we be in exactly this configuration together. And so we value our time together. We open our hearts to song, to story, and let us always keep our hearts open to the questions and mysteries of life. I invite us into worship this morning with words by uh, Latinx uh, writer and minister, Reverend Joan Javier Duval. Out of the depths unknown, the spark of life ignites and we are born. Out of the depths unknown, the spark of life ignites and we are born. We enter a world, a universe, not of our making. Our lives unfold in mystery, and in wonder, questions abound for which there are no definite answers. And so we gather in community to seek in one another assurance and recognition, compassion and strength. We gather in community, however that finds us, 
we gather in community to be reminded of what is most ultimate, what is most sacred in the spirit of searching and of reverence. Let us worship together this morning. Our ch chalice lighting words today are by Ray Naisman. If you have a chalice at home, we invite you to light it with us. We gather around this flame that symbolizes the truth we know and the truth we seek and the, commu the community we share and the community we aspire to. The learning that enables us and the mysteries that encompasses all, us all. Here we are, here we speak languages of memory and hope. We are welcomed in our journeys, embraced and shared. Did you guys have front, uh, any questions for Reverend Beth? Or Griffin, why don't you start, bud? Um, how was God created? Oh, that's a good one. That's a big one. All right. How about you, kiddo? Um, out of these three animals, would you have a turtle, a bird, or a lizard? Good questions. I got one more question. How did uh, we start a caveman then end up a very smart human? Good questions, kiddo. All right. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Where do we come from? Where do we come from? Mystery, mystery. Life is a riddle and a mystery. Mystery, mystery. Life is a riddle and a mystery. Where do we come from? Where are we going? Where do we come from? Where are we going? All righty, good morning. Anjali and Griffin, those are amazing questions and we're gonna save them for Beth to, Re Reverend Beth to answer. <laughs> so, um, oh, I can't wait to hear the answers to those. So, um, good morning. I wanted to tell you all about something that is happening today and how it directly um, connects with our questions of the day. So, we have a program um, through the UUA um, called Our Whole Lives. And you'll hear about it. It's called the OWL program. And we always think about OWL when we, when we talk about um, the OWL program. But it's about um, lifespan sexuality. And that is a program that starts in kindergarten and ends with older folk. The newest program ends for like, like people in their 60s and 70s and 80s. And it is an amazing program um, that our, our church, the um, Unitarian Universalists, and the UCC, the United Church of Christ, created together. Um, and so today at the fellowship, we are gathering Kimberly Lilly, myself, and Amy Jones, and Tim Evelsizer are gathering with a very small group of youth to start their OWL program. And this is for youth headed into 8th, ninth, and 10th grade. And one of the most amazing parts of the OWL program in all the, in all the age ranges, we have something called the question box. You know, like there's some questions that you're like a little nervous about raising your hand. Sometimes it's because we feel like we might be seen as dumb for asking the question. Often when we're talking about lifespan sexuality, it's because we might be a little embarrassed about asking a question, although no questions are dumb or should be embarrassing. So at the end of each of our classes, everyone that's taking the program 
takes a pen and a piece of paper that all look exactly the same, and they write down any question that they want to put into the question box. And that makes it so that all questions are answered and no one has to feel uncomfortable or embarrassed or anything. So every time we start our OWL program, that is the part of the OWL program that I am most excited to do, is the answering and the reading of the questions and the just knowing that all questions will be answered. So I'm looking forward to uh, Reverend Beth's answering of all the amazing questions that were gathered over the last week. And um, let's, don't be frightened to ask questions. Always ask questions. Never stop asking questions. Hello, everyone. We come together in this community with so many questions, and we know that there isn't one answer. There are many possibilities. We wonder about intimacy, about belonging, about being together in community. We wonder about ultimacy, birth, growing, changing, dying. Where did we come from? Where are we going? And I know that my answers to these questions might be different than your answers, and you know, that's just fine. The covenant we wrote guides us in the way we interact together so that we can support each other in our searches for what's true and meaningful for each of us. Collectively, we deepen and we grow. This is our value statement. In mutual love and grace, we journey together grounded in profound respect for a diversity of beliefs and ideas, sustained by service and shared ministry, enriched through collective spiritual deepening and a safe environment for all generations to thrive. And these are our simplified covenant words. Please join me. Together, we are more than we would ever be alone. Therefore, we promise to welcome and include everyone, to listen carefully and speak kindly, to help and share what we have with the community. Thus do we covenant with each other. There is a love holding me. There is a love holding all that I love. There is a love holding all I rest in this love. There Mm, thank you, Kathleen. What a beautiful, not only song, but truth. Do you believe it? Do you believe that there is a love holding you? Do you believe that there is a love holding all of us? In some ways, of course, some might say that that is a mystery, whatever that love is. I invite you to take a breath with me. Just where you are. And just feel your body on the chair, or the couch, or the floor, if you're sitting cross-legged on a floor, wherever you are, just take a breath. And recall 
a time when you've felt loved. Do you have it? And breathe that in. And breathe that out. Think of the time, a time when you have felt, perhaps it's right now, incredible full love. Breathing in and out, breathing in the love, breathing out the love. In times of uncertainty, we are reminded there is love holding us, holding all that we love. I invite you to take another breath and into that space of silence and honesty known by many names. Pray with me. Spirit of life, spirit of love, we pause in this moment. We pause in the middle of mystery, which is truly the middle of our lives. We pause acknowledging all that we are holding, joy, hope and possibility, sorrow, loss, uncertainty, all of it. Spirit of life, we pause and recognize that in this holding, we are being held. As close as our breath, is that love. Perhaps that love is also our breath, spirit of life, pneuma, ruha, moving in through and among us. So there is a love holding us. There is a love breathing us. There is a love holding all that we love. In these times, may each and all remember that love when we do not feel it. In these times, may we remember the love that coaxed existence into being, that is in and through every breath, even as the breath can be an agent of death. And even as others cry out, I can't breathe, may we, in our gift of life and breath, with every breath, may we proclaim there is a love. There is a love moving in and through and among us. May we flow with that love, be agents of that love, that radical love that brings us all into a place of possibility, of justice, of freedom. We are held in love and mystery deeper than we can know. Breathe in that love, beloved ones. Will you take a breath with me again and breathe with me? Breathe in that love, breathe out that love. Let us be and breathe a radical love that allows us to create the beloved community and to know that we are held. May it be so. Amen. And the poet Rilke had admonished a young poet to love the questions in his life. It's often said that Unitarian Universalism, in Unitarian Universalism, we um, seek our own answers to questions of faith, which we usually begin with on Sunday mornings. This is a sanctuary for those seeking companionship in their struggles and journeys. This is a sanctuary for those seeking their own answers to questions of faith. And I also think finding answers and seeking companionship in their struggles and their journeys. And so today I am gonna attempt some answers, just 
looking forward to hearing the questions, hearing what's on your mind. And the thing I love about this is because it lets me know what is important to people and what folks, what y'all are thinking about and curious about. And this is what I know. Any one of you here has your own answers to these questions. My answers may not be the definitive ones. They are just my answers. And um, I'm looking forward to them. Now, Kathleen and Susan are going to throw me some questions. But, um, you know, I'm going to go ahead and begin with uh, Griffin and Anjali, uh, Anjali uh, Tide Gears questions. So, how was God created? There are a couple of ways to answer that question. The first thing that came to my mind was God was created out of the human need to explain the mystery. But I want to adjust that. It's concepts of God were created out of the human need to explain mystery, to explain life. Across space and time, humans in, in all cultures, in communities, have grappled with the quote, big questions, yeah. It's one of the big questions. God is the big question. Sometimes I think God is a big question mark, meaning the mystery, but that's another that could answer another question that I don't know is coming. So on one level, God was, the concept of God was created in order for, as I said, for people to make sense of their lives. But how was God created? Some of that depends on what you believe God is, who you believe God is, how you believe God is. Ultimately, that is actually a mystery. How is God created? Some say that God is the uh, the force, the creative force of the universe, in which case it's still a mystery. Some traditions believe that God created and coaxed everything into being, and that's still a mystery. So it's ultimately a somewhat unsatisfying answer because I can't say how the God of your understanding was created. So what I encourage you to do is explore your concept of God and see what qualities, what characteristics, what feeling comes when you think about God and when you experience God. For me, God is love, God is mystery, God is the holy, God is the breath. And so in some ways, God came into being with me. When I came into being, just like God came into being when you came into being. God came into being when humans could conceive of something beyond themselves and to connect with that. So I love that question, and I could obviously go on and on with that question. Okay, Anjali asked, oh, if I, between the three animals, a turtle, a bird, or a lizard, which would I have? Oh, Anjali, I would have all three. I know that isn't fair, and maybe I have to choose. And I think if I had to choose, I have birds in my backyard that I get to see all the time. And I hope you're seeing them. By the way, I cleaned their feeder and didn't have it up for a couple of days and then they were gone for a few days and I was panicked. What if they never come back? So I kind of already have birds. 
I have lizards that visit my yard. And the one thing I would love to do in my life is hold a lizard in my hand and feel its belly on my palm. I love lizards who I don't have in my backyard. So I have birds and lizards and butterflies, by the way. I don't have turtles. So I think if I had to pick one, I would pick a turtle. I love turtles. They're so interesting. They carry their houses around with them, right? They're amazing. So I hope that's, that answers that question. All right. How did we start as cavemen and are now very smart humans? What a great question. Ah, the question, uh, the answer to that starts at the beginning of time, which is also, the very beginning is also a mystery. But out of the big flaring forth, the big birth, of the universe out of the, a lizard is walking by, by the way, out of the, the creation of our galaxy and our solar system and our earth. The process of evolution allowed for complexity as humans is as, as being slithered out of the ocean. The process of evolution began billions of years of coaxing you, what we know as humans into being. But how did cavemen get to be really, really smart humans? Let's just say that not all humans are very smart that we aspire to be very smart humans. Um, that would be through the evolutionary process, through having the having experiences of experiences uh, that meant that humans had to adapt. So there we know that the cradle of existence of humanity is in uh, on the continent of Africa. There are probably a couple of different strains of quote, caveman-like folks. And through the process of natural selection, adaptation, human beings began to discover and manipulate their environment. So they began to not just um, have to hunt and gather, but started agriculture. And agriculture shaped the human brain and the human community. And over that time, humans created industrialization. So human beings' brains changed in response to how they adapted to, not only adapted to, but manipulated their environment. So that's my short answer to that question. Do we have other questions, Kathleen <laughs> and Susan? In our covenant, we mentioned mindful communication. What exactly is that? How do we practice that effectively? How do we practice and get really good at mindful communication? That's a good question. I think I've preached sermons on that. Somebody might have missed that one and I could do another one because it's really a sermon length answer that I would give to that. So what is mindful communication? Mindful communication is entering into a conversation and into a relationship aware, as aware as possible of who you are in relation to the other person or the situation. To be aware of what's happening in your body when you begin to have a conversation. There are people with whom we easily communicate and in that realm, in that way, to communicate mindfully, which is to communicate respectfully with awareness of what we're saying, how we're saying it, and how we embody what we say. So mindful communication isn't just the words that we say, although the words that we say are important. We're respectful. We acknowledge that our intention doesn't equal the impact 
that our words may have on someone. It's all of that, but it's also an, it's an embodiment. It's a way of being. So mindful communication um, requires that we have a level of self-awareness and it's something that we can learn. It's something that we can practice. Give me the last, the couple of more parts of that question. Cause it was a long question. There's more than one question. So give me a little bit more of that so I can pick that back up. How do we practice and get really good at mindful communication? Well, you practice is how you get really good. And how you practice is, again, that's a relational, uh, the question, the answer is relational. We agree that this is a value. It's a value. So in order to practice it, you need to be in relationship, right? I mean, you can certainly practice on your own. You can explore where you get kind of activated or triggered when someone speaks to you and you have a reaction to that. Um, so you can know that in your body, but you can only practice mindful communication in relationship. At Palomar Fellowship, our, one of our covenants is, one of the clauses is our, of our covenant is that we practice mindful communication. We discerned that we would make an agreement. So one of the ways to practice it is to agree to practice it. There's a level of humility that comes along with mindful communication. Um, I may not always be aware of how I kind of come off or when I react. And in that case, in those cases, then I, I'm hopefully aware of what's happening in my body and I can be aware in the moment or later and then go back and say, that didn't come out the way I wanted it. Can we, can we talk about that? So there's lots of different strategies that we can do that compassionate communication it's often called but it takes commitment, it takes awareness, and it really takes being in relationship and making agreements that we are gonna do that. So why don't we make sure we bracket that one, Susan, and I'll do a whole sermon on it. How's that? All right, Beth, here's your next question. It's okay. near and dear to my heart, even though I did not write this question. So okay. why is art music and creativity so important right now in this time? That's a perfect question. And it is, you know, I could have written it myself as you, Kathleen. Art, creativity is, well, it's, 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 it's core to humanity. <laughs> Cave people made art on their case, right? I mean, it's, it's, art is the impulse of the human soul to uh, connect with the divine, to connect with God, to express their values, and to even just create beauty. So why is it important now? It's important now because art, um, music, the creative expressive arts can give, um, give uh, life um, and expression to our deepest values. They in, it inspires us. It motivates us. It critiques. One of the important things, I got excited about that, could you tell? One of the important things about arts and culture and in the Poor People's Campaign, arts and culture is a huge part of that, as Michael Muffson is one of our arts and culture um, leaders in the state of California is that art gives expression in, to resistance. So you express resistance in art as well. We all saw a police officer kneel on George Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. What was the thing that happened almost immediately? Murals of George Floyd. Not with a police on his neck, but of him in glory. Of him in the 
bigness and importance of who he is. So it, 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 it gives expression to resistance. The other thing that it does is it soothes our souls. It speaks to our souls. And there's, you know, there's all sorts of different kinds of art, right? We're talking about song and creative arts. Um, the song that you sang, Kathleen, Where Do We Come From? Where Are We? Where Are We Going? That's the title of a Paul Gauguin painting. <laughs> so we need art. We need art to, uh, it, it, it expresses our humanity. Um, Coco, the late Coco, the gorilla, she painted, and, um, and I think she was aware that she was creating art personally. But for the most part, it's humans who create art and appreciate art. And so it's an expression of our humanity. It's, uh, as I said, it's, it's a way to articulate our vision. So it isn't just uh, uh, using the, the murals of George Floyd. It didn't just depict him. It depicted a vision of what could be. Um, so poetry, poets. Poets have a way of saying what we know, but we mere mortals can't <laughs> articulate. So it gives voice. Art gives, uh, gives voice, expression, and manifestation of the human impulse to create. Are you ready for the next? I'm ready. I think we could do a whole service on art. So let's do that. Are you making a note of all the services we're going to do, Susan? I'm, I'm just putting little asterisks okay. in. But here's one. Someone sent this message. They said, I'd like to know what process theology is. Great. What a good question. Now, that's a sermon length um, kind of uh, question as well. Process theology is a theological system that comes out of the work of the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead. Alfred North Whitehead wrote in the early 20th century. He started out as a mathematician, actually. He uh, wrote with uh, Bertrand Russell. Um, he was invited to Harvard to teach philosophy when actually when he was in his 60s. He was, he was from, uh, from Cambridge, he was from England. And his philosophical system was called a philosophy of organism. So he didn't call it process philosophy or process theology. He called it a philosophy of organism. And his, his large work called uh, Process and Reality is what really gave the name process philosophy to process philosophy, process theology, and even this other body of work that we call process thought. There are many different expressions of process theology. There are Christian process theologians, there are Hindu, Buddhist, um, non-theist articulations of process theology. So I'm gonna talk just about a couple of expressions of them. And one would be a, a, a more theistic and it's uh, process theology is over against what we call classical theism. Classical theism is the theism of what we call the religions of the book, right? Judaism, uh, Christianity, and Islam, you know, have, have the same notion uh, of God. And it's that, that's in, in Christian theology, it, it would be classical theism. Classical theism posited um, an omnipotent God, um, an omniscient God um, that sees and knows everything. Uh, some, uh, many articulations, right? The old white man in the sky. Uh, but even if you didn't, you know, personify God in that way, or God was seen as, um, as omnipotent and in charge of everything. In process theology, the God of process theology is relational. God is deeply related to the creation 
and to the beings. In process theology, God is not omnipotent. So in other words, um, that Alfred North Whitehead said, all dogmatic certainties are shipwrecked on the rock of the problem of evil, right? All dogmatic certainties are shipwrecked on the rock of the problem of evil. Meaning, if you had a God that was omnipotent and could interrupt the course of natural events, but didn't, who wants, that was for many a very inadequate notion of God. So instead of God's uh, omnipotence, it was in favor of the deep relationality. Now in process thought, in process theology, God, there are three ultimates, God, creativity, and a world. So in process theology, God is contingent upon a world, meaning a universe. God is contingent upon creativity, which is, uh, it's not creativity in the way that we described it earlier. It's kind of that, that impulse or force. So you can see how different process theology is from classical theology and uh, classical notions of God. So you can imagine um, how it is for people who really have this sense and uh, a connection with the divine, but, but can't have these more pernicious uh, aspects of, you know, you know, a God that, um, that could interrupt the course of natural events or evil and doesn't. There are non-theistic process thinkers and uh, one, uh, and so in Unitarian Universalists as well. Charles Hartshorn was a process philosopher and theologian, Henry Nelson Wyman. And one of the best examples um, of a process notion, a non theistic process notion, I heard expressed by Beckett Mufson when he did his credo, when he did his coming of age. And what he described is. Uh, what Wyman called the concept of creative interchange, meaning that when humans interact and connect, there is what I call a moreness, right? So um, that's a little bit about process thought. I'd love to tell you more about three ultimates sometimes, so make a note of that. Too. All right, so we just have a few more minutes of questions and so many amazing questions, Beth. I mean, I think Sunday Service Committee has like three years worth, worth of services here. So um, we have two more questions. And the one I want to ask is, what is your take on the connections with cats? And I assume that's with the human connections with cats. And so what is your take on it? What is my take on the human connection with cats? It would actually be a take on um, the human connection with all beings. Um, sorry to disappoint the questioner. Um, I um, am had by cats um, and I adore them. May and I also feel connected to all um, other beings as well. So the answer is given in the question, what is my take on the connection between humans and other animals? Other animals, because we are one, uh, and in particular cats. When we are attuned and um, can perceive and accept our place in the interdependent web, we have the capacity to enter into relationship with other beings that is transformational. Transformational, trans-species relationships. Other beings, and in this case, cats, when we encounter them in the same kind of way that Martin Buber talked about human connection, which is the I-thou, we recognize our interdependence and our interconnectedness. And we also recognize, and this is a really helpful um, aspect of process uh, thought as well, which we could talk about another time. We recognize the integrity of the individual of that being and their capacity for love, 
for uh, their desires, for their own expression of themselves. I've been formed by my relationship with other animals, including other, in, including cats. The first cat, although I was raised with a German Shepherd named Duke, so dog lovers, I love them and I love y'all too. Hardest part of this pandemic is me not being able to greet every darn dog that I see in Petsmart. So that's another thing. I entered into a relationship with this being Tex and realized that, um, that I, I had transcended just my own self. Um, and I was sure that loving him was the purest thing I ever did. And then enter Lil, short for little one, um, in whom, through whom, I discovered my deep connection with other beings and my respect for them and their own life and my commitment to work toward their liberation, to defend and liberate other beings from human-caused suffering, which is the problem I address in my dissertation. So the connection with cats and other beings um, transformed me and brought me to a level of um, connectedness, and it extends to other beings, to bugs, to lizards, to birds, to everything. So thanks for that. There's a question here that um, I kind of really do want to answer and it might take us a little longer, but I didn't, if you don't mind, I really want to answer this one. And we can, okay, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to name the question. And then I'm going to tell you that I, I, I plan, I've already planned to do a service based on kind of answering this question, okay? And this one was already planned. How do we sustain our spiritual health during this time of anger, fear, and despair? Beloved ones. This is really one of the most important questions that we have on the table right now. And I'm not going to take three minutes to answer it. Because I do actually believe that as a, as a religious community, um, as a gathering, a community of faith, uh, this is the question um, um, that most, uh, that we need to, uh, to give serious time to, not only time, but also serious practice. So um, I don't take, I, I'm not taking any of these questions lightly, not, obviously not even the connection to cats, because I can't even take that lightly, can I? Um, uh, but, but please know either next week or uh, two weeks, uh, or, or the, the 23rd or Susan, whatever service that is, I'm devoting an entire service to, uh, to addressing just that question. Um, in the meantime, breathe. Know that there is a love holding you. Know that I love you. We're going to talk about practices and ways for us to be sustained during this time. Okay? Is that right? Okay. Oh, what's the meaning of life? That's really a good one. I'm just seeing these questions, y'all. I'm sorry, I can't answer them all. I've got one last one. And Beth, it's a question that asks, when are we going to be able to see each other again? When are we going to be able to see all of us again? And I, I know that's a hard one. Right. In person. Yeah, in person. When are we going to be able to see each other again? Yeah. In person. And you know, I wish more than anything that I could give you the definitive answer to that question. And... I can say, I don't know when that exact time is going to be, like when on the calendar that we're going to be able to do that. However, 
we will do that and gather together as a worshiping community when it is safe to do so. So much of what we, um, what we value in worship is what? It's leaning into each other, holding hands, singing together, those activities that I miss so much and long, long, long to do with you, y'all. And we're going to do that when it's safe to do that. And I don't know when that's going to be. I know that we want to do it when it's safe for everyone. Uh, we know that we want to continue to protect the most vulnerable, our, each other in our community. We know that there may be others that we will not be able to see again in person. And that's a reality that we have to hold as well. So it begs another question. What do we do in the meantime? We do what we're doing. We recognize that in this interconnected world, in the world of process philosophy, process thought, process theology, we are deeply, deeply connected. We can use practices that allow us to feel that connection with one another. I really do believe that breathing together at 10 a.m., whether you really are or you just thought of it, like it went off on your phone and you went, oh crap, I don't have time to do 10 breaths, maybe I'll do one. That that's part of what we can do. Yeah, it's a hard question. But what I know is that we are committed to keeping everyone safe and doing everything that we can to connect. And so in anticipation of all of that, tell everyone you can that you love them. Never pass up the opportunity to tell, the pe tell people that you love them. And you know what? Maybe not even people that you think you love. I'm indiscriminately telling people I love them now. The customer service person on the phone who went, uh, uh, thank you. Let love guide us in these times. And just know that it ties into the question of how do we maintain our spiritual health in this time, knowing that there will be tremendous loss. And knowing that through that, we remain connected in the ways that we can. I wish I could tell you beloved ones, but this is the one thing I know. I love you. Thanks for all these great questions. We come together, we connect with each other in covenant to help and share what we have with each other and with the community. We share our time, our talents, our treasures, and we share with the larger community as we give half of our undesignated offering to a local nonprofit organization in our plate share program. This quarter we're sharing with Produce Good. This is an innovative group that rescues fruits and vegetables that might otherwise end up in the landfill and delivers it to community organizations that share it out to those who may be hungry. If you're currently in a position to give or continue making your pledge payments, there are several ways to do that, even as we shelter in place. You can write a check and mail it to our office. You can check in with our office administrator to find out how to set up auto payments or how to pay through our database. And it's very easy to text to give. See the instructions on the screen or in the chat.
thank you, Susan. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you to all of you for your wonderful questions. There's another one here um, that I really like. You know I love this, don't you? Um, and, and we will uh, take a look at this in another uh, service. Um, humans in, in our country are divided. How do we build meaningful bridges? How can we stop? How can I stop feeling angry at people whose actions I perceive as being selfish, etc. So uh, yeah, these are great questions and I look forward to um, answering, uh, you know, grappling with them. Because, oh, my video's not on. Sorry about that. Um, yay, I was reading the questions. Um, I think I'm gonna call this service from now on um, the grappling with questions box service because it's really what we're doing we're grappling you know there's some things that yeah you can answer um but i'm i'm just so deeply deeply appreciative of uh, all of you and you could see how distracted i was that i was reading the chat um and getting a a, a good look at some of these questions so ah so beloved ones this is an invitation as we go forth to stay connected even as we stay away and uh, stay safe. Um, to remind you, you that there are numerous ways for you to connect throughout the week um, and you know, be aware of those. Um, who will win the grappling? <laughs> In a, uh, it was a, like arm wrestling, right? Between, uh, RBG and Greta, you know, probably RBG, I'd like to think. <laughs> so I invite you to join me in our chalice extinguishing words. Although we extinguish this flame, we carry in our hearts the light of truth, the warmth of community, and the fire of commitment until we are together again. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Where do we come from? Where do we come from? Mystery. Mystery, life is a riddle and a mystery. Mystery, mystery, life is a riddle and a mystery. Where do we come from? Where are we going? Where do we come from? Where are we going? Good question, Kathleen. <laughs> uh, yes. So, beloved ones, as this service concludes, I invite you to go in peace, be makers of peace. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti.